Well, everyone, welcome to the monthly annual, excuse me, monthly podcast with uh, Andy Sheckman, CEO of Miles Franklin, one of our key affiliate partners and sponsorships that we meet with every month for a financial symposium on where we are with the current financial and global events. So as always, please do like, subscribe and share and hit that notification bell so you don't miss a minute of the updates. Uh, as you know, Andy has well over a uh, 30 uh, years in the uh, financial sector, pr particularly in precious metals and all things pertaining to it. And so we're going to stretch the boundaries of his knowledge capacity today, as always. Andy, my brother, thanks for being here. How are you doing, sir? It's good to see you, my man. I'm good. I'm good. About How about you? Yeah, I'm hanging in there. It's been a busy month, for sure. And it yeah, promises well, to be more. you know, I think that that's good. The time flies, but... Uh, you know, that's one of the characteristics, I think, of the last four years. It just seems that everything seems to be flying at a much more accelerated pace. Craziness everywhere around us seems to, I think, you know, it's weird, John, when you think about the way it used to be when we were kids, like something newsworthy would come about once every few months or mm -hmm. once a year. It just seems that new, newsworthy items go in one ear and out the other, and and some can be so big that they would have been earth shattering years ago and then they just vaporize into the ether and we move on it's become part of the fabric i guess you at least in my mind it's like i think of the last four years and it's just a blur so nothing right. new for me here but i'll tell you i have a feeling buddy that between here and the end of the year it's gonna spin even faster i agree but i would even take it one step further andy i'd say between now and and middle of end of october it's going to be absolutely frenetic and, and you're right we're we're in a vacuum of news now with the app and the internet and so much information flowing about precipitously that it's 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 hard for me to keep up and I'm sure for you as well. Uh, speaking of which, as, as I told you offline, we're gonna switch things up a little bit on this month's segment to talk about some things since we're in a very appropriately solemn day. Um, I wanted to get your impressions briefly of the debacle last night known as the debate. You know, it, to me, John, one of the most depressing things about everything we've, even going back to the pandemic in 2020, as, as strange as this sounds, I was less concerned about the pandemic, knowing, knowing that it would run its course, than I was about the massive amount of censorship that I saw. Uh, the change in the narrative where I would go on people's shows, and if if you didn't say something like, the Cerveza sickness, instead of calling it by its name, Corona, or or mentioning the the president's son's name, or any of these things, you would have your get a strike against you, your YouTube channel shut down, misinformation, disinformation. One of the gals shows who's just a sweet, sweet lady. Her name is Sarah Westall. Go Daddy took her entire uh, domain, took it from her, stripped it, kicked her off, and the stuff that she was talking about proved to be correct and. It's the same thing here. When you look at what's happened to the lack of journalistic integrity, it, it's it's disheartening and frightening to me how the how the the media is able to gaslight everything. And when you look at the questions that Trump was asked, um, like for example, you know, you said that uh, she was black. I mean, okay, why even ask such a stupid question? How about focus on things that really matter instead of instead of goading him into saying things that that aren't flattering you knew he would do that and but the questions that were asked were so one-sided so stupid so meaningless of course the january 6th nonsense again and it, it's just the lack of journalistic integrity is terrifying to me and you know i don't even want to go here but i'll just simply say because of this type of behavior, because of this type of behavior by the media, it lends you into saying things and believing things and wondering, is there a fine line between conspiracy and reality? Now, I, I, you know, if it were fair and balanced, I wouldn't say this, but, you know, you've listened to the things that, that Pre Vice President Harris has said for the last several years, and it's cringeworthy. Most of it is just goofballish. Now, if you watched her last night, and I, I, I can't even believe I'm going to say this, but you look at the left side of her face and you could see her ear clearly. You look at the right side and her hair didn't move and you couldn't see her ear. It just makes you wonder. She hasn't sound that articulate in four years. So did she have an earpiece in? Was mm. she being coached? 
You sure hell it sure as hell seems that way when she answers questions in a way she never did. When the questions to her were lollipop softballs, when the questions to him were stupid and meaningless, like you called her black, what did you mean by that? Uh, or are you? Are, did you regret anything that you did on January 6th? I mean, who cares about any of this? This is supposed to be a debate about the current events, and it just goes to show how the cards are stacked against him. They tried to kill him. They tried to throw him in jail. Everything they have done has been stacked against him, and even in what should be a debate amongst Two candidates for the American public to witness themselves, uh, are these people qualified? The questions were stupid and, and stacked against him, and it, either she had an earpiece in or was coached and, and told what questions were coming, because in four years, she's never sounded that clear, ever. And uh, I don't know, it's disheartening to me, John, and I, I, I hope that I am not traveling down a conspiratorial rabbit hole, but what I have learned in my career is that there's a fine line between conspiracy and reality. And last night, I think we treaded that line pretty close. Yeah. And I am obviously, you know, I agree with you and people watch our, our podcast, I think, know pretty clearly where we stand on these issues. But uh, I feel that way as well. I, I posted my telegram that there were clear and present signs of, of earpieces. And going back to 2023, they had this stuff designed. And, you know, the deep state is going to try everything they can to cheat. It isn't. It's they can they're going the military is going to have Starlink and they're going to have all these things to mitigate it. They'll still try to cheat, but it, it, I think it'll do little, if anything, to effectuate the outcome of President Trump uh, getting his rightful place. And I would also say the little that I was able to stomach last night just for posterity for my audience, um, I would say it did little, if anything, to change the constituents of voters. If you're going to vote one way, you're probably going to remain that way. And, you know, same on the other side. But um no, I, I, I think that, there's, that's the ahead. sad part of it, John, because the debate should have been a chance for people that, you know, for these people to showcase their platform instead of being asked ridiculous questions mm -hmm. that have nothing to do about where we are as a country. And instead, it was just it was theater. It was it was um, it was grotesque. And and I, mm -hmm. I I just I hate feeling this way because, like, you know, I'm a patriot. I love this country. This country's done so much for me, allowed me to achieve things that I in my life wouldn't think I ever would have mm -hmm. achieved. And um, I thank God every day I was born here. But I'll tell you, man, when you see stuff like this and, and you know, it's funny when you watch Fox News, and I'm not saying that they're the best either. And in fact, all the mainstream news is kind of corrupt and same. owned by the same group of companies. But right. it's interesting when they will show a montage of a few phrases and then they'll show every single news outlet from ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, and all the different anchors over all the different time slots throughout the day. They all say the exact same six words. And it's like, they're all being fed the same nonsense. And so the, that's the problem. There are a lot of very well-read people out there. They're just not reading the right stuff. You could argue, I could argue you get a better education of current events by watching your YouTube channel than you would by watching the evening news. And, and that's the problem where educated, articulate, well-read people doesn't really transcend or translate into understanding where we are. It just means you're reading the wrong stuff and being misdirected mm -hmm. the wrong way. Yeah. And, and, and again, Andy, to your point, which is very cogent, you know, part of our channels, yours and mine help mitigate the, the or stem the tide of all that. So, because again, at the end of the day with the public, right? And I think you and I would totally agree on this and I'm lying to our audience as well. There are many important issues, but if you can't feed your family, if you can't keep them safe, if you can't put a house, a home, a roof over their head, if you don't have some roadmap of security for your future economically, all that, all those other issues, you know, take a back seat, right? right. And, 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 uh, you know, he was, desperately trying to get it back on track with that. I would say, and I think most people would say the, the consensus I've seen online about you is that, and then we'll move on to the next thing is that it seems that he wasn't debating so much Kamala, but the, the ABC and how incredibly biased it was. And for the first time, there seems to be some court of public opinion narrative wise that, that is finally pointing out to just how biased and completely skewed the media has always been, particularly right now. It's just wrong, you know? I mean, where is the integrity of the whole journalistic um, ecosystem? Where where did it go? Who, right. 
you know, where did it go? I, I, I find it very troubling because there are people that I care about in my life a lot that are very, very bright, very well read, reading mm -hmm. the wrong stuff. And it creates animosity to the point where I have to go to Thanksgiving dinner and my wife has to warn me, don't open your mouth. Yeah. Well, this time I'd like to stay for the whole evening. And, and where we are as a result of this, where the media doesn't do anything but create divisiveness, it, 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 it divides us on so many levels. Uh, it's become visceral. And, you know, that's another thing you take away. You know, she starts out the evening by saying he's going to, you know, call me names and this and that. Yet she was calling him names the entire time, putting him down, belittling him the entire time. Right. All of these generals that were, they think you're a disgrace. And this, I mean, it's like, it's become so awful that I think it just makes us the laughing stock of, of the free world. You know, it's, uh, I don't know. I wish I didn't feel the way I did, but I do. And uh, I don't think it was anything but a, but a sideshow. Yeah, agreed. I mean, it's, it's projection 101. And then, you know, I was thinking about President Reagan when you were talking about in respect to your family dynamics during the holidays. It's not that, I think he said something to the effect of it's not that people aren't smart. It's just, they know so much it isn't so. <laughs> and that's kind of where we find ourselves. Um, pivoting to the next point before we go into our questions, it is 9-11. It is a very important day. Uh, I have a testimony to share, but I would like to hear yours first about where you were on 9-11 and how it effectuated your life. I remember backing out of the driveway when I heard it on the radio and turned back around, ran in the house and, and, and watched it. And uh, I mean, how do you not forget? I mean, how, do, how does anyone forget that? I, I talk to people who who, you know, when I moved to Southern Florida, uh, I'm one of the few guys in on the East Coast here that's from the Midwest. Almost all of the people in, in the in the country club I live at are from Queens and Manhattan and New York mm -hmm. and Brooklyn and all over, you know, New Jersey. Um, and a lot of them were there as well. And and I've heard some crazy, crazy stories, really crazy stories. But yeah, it's uh, it, it's here again, you know, I wish there wasn't a fine line between conspiracy and reality. And I don't want people to, you know, discount these things and say, well, he's a conspiratorialist. But when you look at like building seven, how it fell in a controlled fashion. And, and when you watch how these buildings just drop straight down and all of the things that make you wonder, uh, you almost have to wonder, you know, and, and, and that gave us th then the reason to go into Iraq looking for weapons of mass destruction, which we've never found. And we're still there mm -hmm. 20 years later, occupying their country and on and on and on. So again, you know, I, I don't normally say this stuff. In fact, I don't think I've ever said this online on an interview, but here again, it just seems so much that we see nowadays is, is there a fine line between conspiracy and reality? Could, could it have been a false flag event? I don't know. It certain, certainly has the hallmarks of it. How else do you get into, get the, 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 the country to rally around you to go into Iraq? And I mean, and all of these things that have created as a result of it, the death to destruction, God forbid it really were, um, I don't know. It's it's one of these deals that I think, again, it creates a lot of, it's very polarizing, crea creates a lot of divisiveness. But you, know, you watch these shows, you see all the architects who signed on to it and said buildings don't fall this way. You see Building 7, you see all of these things and wonder, you know, here again, could this actually be? I don't know how you feel about it. I don't know how I feel about it. I remember Jesse Ventura had a very cool pod uh, TV show and, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the shows was about... Um, 9/11, and he talked about thermite, and it was, and how it was, how it was on all of the the interior, you know, was painted on all the interior beams and this and that, and that's how it fell straight down, boom, 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 boom like that. And I don't know, man, I'm almost frightened to e to even hear myself say these things. But in the back of my mind, I wonder. I say this is more or less how I feel. Like there's just buildings don't fall that way, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know. I don't know how you feel. Well, first of all, thanks for sharing your testimony. I appreciate that. Um, I have a unique testimony myself. I was actually there that day. I was living in uh, Brooklyn, Sheepshead Bay, for those who know the area. I'm sure a lot of your being at your country club, I was graced back in May with you to meet some of your, your fine uh, uh, patrons there and constituents. Uh, probably know that area well. 
and I was taking a train, which is known, uh, Andrew, as a the D train, Canal Street. So what it does is it goes all the way from Brooklyn into lower Manhattan. It goes underground, it comes above ground. And what I remember vividly, it was 8.48 a.m. And I remember the second tower was starting to go on fire at the top. And it, it, I, we were facing the north end. So it was kind of, kind of like looking north, kind of northeast at, to, your, to your left vantage point, if you can picture on the train. And everybody was like, oh, what's going on? And, and alarm bells are going off for me. I got out of the train, ran up to the top of the platform, got outside. And what I remember, there was enclaves of people in, encircled, like groups of eight to 10, kind of staring up at the sky. Some people were quiet. Some people were crying. Some people were, what is that? What's going on? In my, in my spirit, in my discernment, I knew something was very wrong beyond the obvious. Like there was something, something wasn't adding up. So I ran to my office. I was a young kid at the time, just fresh out of college, more or less. And I get to the top of my office on the third floor. I was on 684 and Broadway for those who are, it's near NYU. So it's about, I don't know, somewhere between six and eight long blocks from, from ground zero. So it's not right there, but it's, it's an earshot. I get up to the office. I turn on the TV. I'm watching what's going on. Of course, I wasn't awake back then like I am now. And history teaches you things. Um, I remember I needed to get an email out to my parents to let them know I was okay. And then shortly after I did that, I went to pick up the phone. Phone lines were dead. They were saying the lines were burned underground and all that, which I'm still not convinced that was a natural occurrence. Um, I felt when the buildings came down, I felt our building like an earthquake shake. And I had never felt an earthquake before. So that was the closest thing until getting here in California that I could relate to. When it was about 1130, my boss said, just wait till the storm clears and go home if you can. I got outside. All the restaurants were closed. You had TVs out where people could watch. What I vividly remember, Andy, was there was a black gentleman, African-American gentleman, whatever you want to call it, walking towards me. And I could tell that normally he, he was wearing like business casual and he would have like normally have black shoes. He was covered in soot. Like if you poured baking, so baking powder on your head and on your shoes, just covered completely from head to toe. What struck me though, was he didn't say anything. I could have closed my eyes and been in the, the wild west and had a, a whirling dervish like you see in the movies, you know, the, uh, uh, one of those uh, dust bins going across a desolate road. It was, you could hear a pin drop in the city. I've never heard it that quiet before in all the years that I've been there growing up in the East Coast and New England and been living in New York for 11 years, never heard it like that. Um, I remember trying to get a train home, which would normally take 40 minutes, took about four hours. They had police normally. Now, of course, you would expect abnormally police uh, ramped up security to get people home. My dad told me that he had friends, uh, clients uh, for Cantor Fitzgerald, if you remember that company, the CFO was in one of the buildings, completely gone. I remember talks about the firemen saying that in all the years, they had never heard anything like that, or of course, abnormally. But it was, like you said, a controlled demolition. It was like, doom, 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 going down. Like it was de detonated. Because I remember seeing, looking up and going, planes don't fly 1,200 feet. They don't fly that low. And if you did, and I'm not here to argue the merits of whether there were or not planes, but I'm just saying what the questions were in my mind of how could this possibly be? Because if a plane did hit a building, sections of the fuselage, the wings would be coming down to the ground. It wouldn't just go clean into a building with no debris of any type. It's just a lot of things didn't add up to me. And it, it was very hard for me years later to even come around to the notion of it being an inside job. Um, but our government has never been for us. It's been clear in the financial system, as you can see. And if you can make those parallels, it's not so hard to make parallels with other things. So this is a day that for me is always a very hard one, having lived through it directly, personally there, um, and knowing people that that perished in that building. So that's well, the massive shorting of the airline stocks the day before, too. I mean, that kind of was a little and, bit intriguing. Yes, and they didn't find a plane at the Pentagon. And there was CNN footage of a gentleman saying that they didn't find a plane there. They took that off the air immediately. We've, we've, we've archived that before. So there are just too many things, like you said, that that don't add up, but you know, we want to be there and pray for the people who lost their families. You know, we don't want to be insensitive to that. Obviously, there were real victims, there were, you know, people that are are still suffering. And my heart and my prayers and my sincere sadness goes out for them. And uh, it, it's a day. Certainly, that was you know, I was not alive obviously through the JFK era, but that was my JFK moment where I'll never forget it.
Yeah, no, it's and, and nor should you. Um, sure. Regardless of 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 what the truth really is, or if we'll ever know it, right. um, you know, um, a lot of people lost their lives, and the world has never been the same since. Speaking of JFK, I guess I can say this because. Sure. I was on an interview with Robert Kiyosaki yesterday where he said this. He said it, uh, I was on doing it with Glint, uh, and Robert spoke about it. And he said, listen, I did an interview with um, um, RFK Jr. And uh, he said he knows who who um, who killed his father and his uncle. And, and, it, and they weren't, uh, it wasn't a lone assassin. You know, and this is what he says publicly. And you know, one of the things Trump said he would do if if he won the election this time is to release all of that with you know, take out all of the redactions and release it. So, you know, again, um, what what's what's the 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 phrase? You know, uh, uh, for the greater good, I guess you could say, is the way that they are able to rationalize some of this stuff. So, it would be better if we didn't believe that this was the case. But sometimes you have you have a hard time rationalizing how these things just happen coincidentally. So, um, yeah, well, we keep on marching on and I would rather have my eyes open and understand what's happening rather than be blindsided by it. Um, because I think there's a lot more in store for what's coming, at least in terms of economics, in terms of, uh, um, you know, the way that things shake out with the dollar as being the world reserve currency and, Mm -hmm. And the markets and and uh, all of the things that go along with that, we have yet to begun to see how things shake out. And yeah, that's just one piece of the puzzle, I guess, the politics of it and um, yeah. and the you know the the rabbit holes that you can go down and and you know, logic makes you feel as though you're on the right path, but it still makes you feel like almost dirty having these thoughts and these feelings. And could it really be? Maybe we'll never know, but we we look at Occam's razor and we look at all of the, the evidence and and try to be logical about it. And sometimes you come away believing your worst fears and your worst concerns. But sometimes that's how I feel. Yeah, and I think we're going to see the truth come out. To your point with JFK Jr. with Trump once he's back in, I think I think that's the biggest fear the deep state has is that the truth they were trying to hide. But the, the truth always comes out, and and as uncomfortable and as hard as it is. It makes you free, Johnny 32 in the, in the Bible. But also, um, that's what you and I do on the financial end, or at least we work to do, is uncover the truth for the people so they can be armed with the knowledge that can empower them to make good discernmental decisions, right? And so, apologize, folks, I don't know a good segue out of 9-11 into finances, so you'll have to bear with me. This is not something we ordinarily do, but we're in, as you say, extraordinary times, Andy. So... Um, Pivoting, I guess, the best we can forward. Let's start with that, which you just brought up, Andy, about uh, Robert <laughs> Kiyosaki, because I heard uh, him say often that gold and silver is God's money, Haggai 2.8. And the U.S. Constitution backs us up. I believe it's by providence and stated in Article 1, Section 10, no state shall make a thing but gold and silver a tender in payments of debts. Now, we're going to talk about bricks at the very end. But before we get to that, do you think we will be going back here uh, to gold and silver being legal tender? Well, in the interview I was doing with Robert, it was with um, Jason Cousins, who's the uh, president of Glint. And I am more or less the U.S. contact for Glint. And his whole goal, what he's been doing over the last year or so, has been meeting with and working with dozens of state legislatures for this reason. Um, and you know, there's 11 states that have already moved in that direction. Although the, the, the law says you can't make a shopkeeper take gold or silver uh, issued by a sovereign mint um, as legal tender. But if they want to, you can. You can pay your property taxes in there. There's 11 states that have passed that already. Um, upwards ends of 20 plus more that have it in front of their legislatures. This is what Jason is, is doing. And you're right. It says that the states cannot make their own currency unless it's gold or silver. And so this is the the American spirit, perhaps pushing back against the the madness of the, you know, uh, of the federal government, of the monetary policy of the Fed and the fiscal irresponsibility of the Treasury. And and so I'll say it this way, John, I never thought I'd see 11 states pass these laws ever. The fact that we have and there's more that have it um lined up in front of their legislature yeah i have 
it gives me pause, gives me hope um, that indeed this is, you know, at least some form of of a pushback against the lunacy of of a country that's creating one hundred thousand dollars in debt per second, twenty four seven. Yeah. Yeah. And then also, Andy, another sort of angle to vantage point to consider is we have love it or hate it, folks. You know, Bitcoin, Trump's a Bitcoin president, but he's also going to be XRP president. We know other we've talked about, you know, XRP before once they're released from the corrupt SEC, which I'm convinced Gary Gensler is going to step down once that appeal is dropped because he's not going to wait till Trump's back in. It doesn't bode well for him optically better off to do it you know, in the cover of darkness, like we're seeing with Warren Buffett dropping all these Bank of America shares and the like, because they know it's coming. Um, what I'm getting at is I'm thinking that people could use cryptos like Bitcoin, like XRP, like XLM and other things to, uh, to be forms of payment if people are reticent to do physical asset payment up front. Is that a possibility? I, I suppose it is a possibility. Um, again, it's the question of adoption, you know, mass adoption. Mm -hmm. It would be better for something like XRP to have that go along in an orderly fashion mm -hmm. or all hell breaks loose because I don't think it has mass adoption yet for it to be efficient. Right. Uh, that doesn't mean that the groundwork isn't being laid other places where it would be an efficient transition. But, you know, um, in a grid down craziness type of situation, I don't I don't think it 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 doesn't have the, the adoption or the ability i think to to be what it ultimately can be if all of a sudden we transition and the pieces have been put into place and the and the the technology has been integrated then yeah it has tremendous applications um and potential i am not a crypto basher at all i am not someone who understands the inner workings of it well enough to comment on it but simply to say as i've always said and as i mean i do believe with it is a complementary asset class to precious metals the, the theories the ideas the decentralization the having it in your own possession the lack of counterparty risk free from the matrix all of these things are are similar um it's just that you know this is a once in a generation shift mm -hmm. a changing of the guard the crossing the rubicon right and what does that look like is it orderly i don't think it will be i think it will be at 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 in in some sort of an event that necessitates a change. And the question is, are are the pieces, are the tracks being laid? And if that is the case, and this then becomes part of the solution, part of the new ecosystem, yeah, absolutely. In the midst of chaos, no, I don't think it is the place to be. I really don't. Um, I think people will be want will, will want to be off the grid as much as possible. And I've heard people some people say xrp is decentralized others people say not really because so much of it is controlled by ripple lab so i don't know is it is it not i'm not the guy to ask but what i would say is that if things get very dirty and ugly i think having things like precious metals become a necessity and i don't sell precious metals or tell people to buy it for that reason and to me it's it's wealth it's wealth that has outlived everything the world's thrown at it and will be wealth when the transition happens as well Right. But it also gives you the ability to bridge that transition, in my opinion, uh, where some forms of crypto wouldn't simply because the adoption level is not sufficient enough yet. Um, maybe the closest thing to it would be Bitcoin. But, you know, not not to, to say anything negative about XRP at all. It's just that, you know, it, it, it certainly doesn't have the understanding or the adoption that, that Bitcoin does, and at least not by the mainstream. So, uh, maybe that's in store for us maybe that's part of the new ecosystem where this will be the bridge to to for a lot of of, of countries and institutions to trade uh, more efficiently more cost effectively and i know that's part of what xrp offers so uh don't know if that did anything other than just confuse you or not but <clears throat> i just don't think it's the asset to own for for chaos i think it's the asset to own when the dust settles no i i, I completely understood what you're saying well and i'll answer that with you, or we'll broach that again at, towards the end when we talk about bricks towards the end of the podcast here. So I want to read something real quick, Andy, to get your impressions. You were talking about the uh, the U.S. debt. Genevieve Rovdector, CFA over on X, talked about this yesterday. Uh, Justin, U.S. debt so massive and interest costs now $3 billion a day, as you said. 
U.S. debt hits, hits 35.3 trillion with daily interest payments now averaging 3 billion, according to Apollo. If the Fed cuts interest rates by 1%, uh, 1 which you know we're gonna talk about that in a minute, uh, the entire yield curve declines by 1%, then daily you would have something closer to 2.5 billion. So it's kind of an interesting demarcation with what's coming up, which actually is uh, segues, if it's okay with you to my next question, uh, which we're a week away now, very ironically, the timing of a Fed rate cut, which promises to be the first of many. Fed has tacitly admitted, Andy, as you know, that the unemployment numbers and job numbers were woefully underperforming because we know they're fudging numbers to begin with. Uh, the couple of questions I have is, do you see a 50 basis point cut this month consistently into the end of the year? And if so, do you see us being in a season of rate cuts for 2027? What does that mean for the dollar index? I do see a 50 basis point rate cut. It's pretty much baked into, I mean, there's almost a hundred percent chance of it. At least the traders mm -hmm. seem to think so. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you mentioned the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So the Fed has a dual mandate. The dual mandate is, is of stable pricing, i.e. inflation and or full employment. Both of the numbers that we get out of the Bureau of Labor Statistics are for Gazy. And you talk about um, inflation, John Williams of Shadow Stats will tell you add an eight to the number, and that's what you're at. And he just bases it upon the way they used to be measured. Uh, so he says we're at 11% inflation. They tell us we're at three, but still 50% away from where they their their goal of 2%. While the, the stock market is at or near its all-time highs, and the real estate market is above its 2000 and and six peak. Uh, so although not at all time highs, pretty damn close to it. And I would simply say to you that, you know, it, it's pouring gasoline on, on a bonfire. Um, it will just reignite the inflation. They have given in to inflation, in other words, is what they're telling you. If you're 50% away, you're giving in to, to inflation. And it's probably because we're in the midst of a recession. You know, there are two very, very accurate indicators of a recession. One is the SAM rule. It's named after an economist named Claudia SAM, S-A-H-M. I may be pronounced, it could be SAM. Anyways, it's anticipated the last nine recessions with a 100% track record, and it identifies the onset of an inflation, I mean, of recession by looking at the increase in the employment rate. And if the three-month moving average of unemployment rises by over 5.5 or five basis, 50 basis points, uh, half a percent from its low, then you're in a recession and it has a hundred percent success rate over, over, um, you know, the last, I don't know, nine recessions. And it's now up 0.53. It's up 53 basis points. So according to Claudia, we would be in a recession. And the same thing is true of the yield curve, which was, it was the most uninverted or the most inverted since 1929 and you go back and look at all the recessions since 1950, it's predicted it perfectly that once the curve uninverts, which just happened right now, um, that you are in a, a recession. And using unemployment as your metric, unemployment is a lagging indicator, which would tell you we are in a recession right now. So yes, they've given in to their inflation uh, aspirations, and they're trying to save the economy, which seems to be be in trouble. And when you talk about the numbers, you know, yeah, you have 1.3 million jobs that were lost, um, full-time jobs really in the last year that have been replaced. Roughly two thirds of those have been replaced by part-time jobs, most of which by illegal immigrants. Uh, we are one and a half million jobs down from the June, 2023 20, peak full-time jobs and a million jobs were replaced, pretty much a million, um, year over year uh, in the month of August, mostly comprised with illegals in part-time jobs. It was the 16th straight month of part-time job increase, 16th months of part-time job increase. So yeah, it, it, this is something where, you know, when you see the hedge funds have sold dumping stocks 12 of the last 13 weeks when the insiders that you mentioned the, the Bezos and the Buffets and all these folks, they sold at the end of the second quarter. Something's coming. There's no question about it. And then don't forget about the carry trade, right? Because mm -hmm. everyone talked about the yen going up or raising the, the rates. Well, the same thing holds true if the dollar yield goes down. 
And so if the, it, it's the same thing in reverse, it still affects the unwinding of the carry trade. That's not over yet either. So, you know, I don't know how far we go. I don't think they can afford to go much lower if they do. All the credibility is out the window as it is. You know, austerity is dead. Go back to 2019. The Fed said, we're going to normalize the balance sheet. They tried to raise rates. The whole repo market crisis happened. They backed off. You look at the UK a, a two years ago, year and a half ago, they tried to uh, you know, raise rates and create austerity and 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 uh, balance their their you know normalize their balance sheet. Their pension program started to blow up. They back off and pivot. You look at Japan. They tries to they try to raise rates. The whole thing breaks apart. Okay, we're going to back off and pivot. You look at the U.S. Try to raise rates above five percent. The banks start to implode. We're screwed. The whole Western system is screwed because they messed with Mother Nature. And messing with Mother Nature is suppressing interest rates for a long period of time that distorts the, the the asset prices. Price discovery is dead. And when you have asset prices that are stratospheric caused by suppression of interest rates, as rates rise and the real value has to find equilibrium with the rising interest rate environment, asset prices collapse. And that's where they're at. Either you raise rates and and let the system break or the forest fire rage, and it burns down the whole system, which should have been done in 2008, because in 08, the Fed's balance sheet was 800 billion. It's 9 trillion, or just under 9 trillion now, as they've tightened a bit. So it's eight and a half trillion. Well, they put they added eight trillion dollars in bond purchases in 15 years. That suppressed interest rates. It, it strengthened the bond market, the real estate market, the stock market. And and there's a term in in economics, um, and and it is called um. Oh my gosh, it is called, uh, the closest to the money supply is called, the what effect? I can't even believe I can't think of it at the moment. Some of the Cantillon effect? Uh, Cantillon effect, thank Cant you. Cantillon effect. And it's a Cantillon effect, and and this is, it, you can see it in, in glaring fashion. The Cantillon effect sees, says that here, whoever's closest to the money benefits disproportionately. Look mm -hmm. at the hedge funds and all of the big money who could borrow at next to nothing and buy assets. Asset prices have been jacked up. But by the time these folks sell or by the time the money filters its way down to the bottom like we are now, we're at raging inflation and people can't even afford to put food on their table as the rich have been unaffected by this inflation at all as their asset prices have gone way up. And and that's what the Cantillon effect in, in you know, that's textbook. And now we're seeing inflation much stronger than we're led to believe, right? They're telling right. us inflation is only 3%, but John Williams says it's 11. And uh, so, yeah, you reignite the inflation spigot. It's just going to be that much harder for, for um, low-income families, and the wealthy will get wealthier. So it's, uh, it's a bad thing. I don't know that they'll be able to continue to lower rates. Um, maybe they will, um, but... If they do, it's like all governments have done, and it will just become obvious that we'll never normalize their balance sheet. Even if Trump wins, he's talking about lowered, lowered interest rates, a weak dollar, and sanctions against countries moving away from the West. This is the same stupid playbook. Right. So he's not going to fix the economy or the dollar, but what he would do is install law and order, reinstall law and order, at least in my opinion, and 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 provide a little bit of... of um, sanctity, if you will, in the pillars and the institutions of this country, the, namely, you know, the judicial and electoral and immigration system and the <laughs> lawlessness. But in terms of both candidates' policy, um, you know, Trump wants super low interest rates and, and a weak dollar. Um, and and that's obviously what, what Kamala wants right now. And that's what, what this administration is looking for, lowered rates. That doesn't all that does is pour more gasoline, and we should have let the fire burn a long time ago. And at some point, Mother Nature is going to take her piece pound of flesh. And until that, until we let that happen, yeah, it's just um, making it worse. It's like pushing a beach ball underwater further and further and further and further until it finally mm -hmm. pops up and knocks your chin off. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, I think, what we're at right where we're at right now. So yeah, it, I think fifty basis points, but I'm not confident. That will continue to see him go hard after that because of the unintended consequences in things like the carry trade, which could blow up in our face very quickly. So I guess we'll have to see.
Indeed, you know, there's a lot to unpack, Andy, with what you just shared and, and a lot of uh, micro details there. We just had a, a show, as I showed you offline with a mutual friend, Bill Holter, last week, and we, we talked about a lot of these things. So I always like to get your your position on his to kind of, you know, give the audience a, a sense of, of cross I love comparison. Billy. Billy's a great guy, very oh, smart, yeah. good friend of mine, and uh, yep. speaks, speaks uh, the truth. I mean, you'll always know where you stand with Bill, that's for sure. He is a man's man, indeed. He's the, the last of the John Waynes, for sure. And uh, But it's our team's strong contention, Andy, that with talking with Bill, he mentions John Rich, and, and I studied his book recently, and it looks, it, it's hard to get an exact number, but according to John Rich's data matrix, the real rate of unemployment, he believes, is somewhere between, as a range, 17 to 25%, which is pretty staggering versus what we're being lied to about and actually, if you look at the numbers, according to Bill's matrix, right, which you obviously hold in high esteem like myself, it's his contention and ours as well that according to the GDP reduction since 2022, we're actually in a depression and they're just not saying it, which, as you just said, buffers perfectly with historical replication of 2008. We're seeing the same exact patterns. If you recall, back in 08, they were starting to drop rates like they did then. And then they tried to do a, a, a you know bailout and create all this artificial money, right? I mean, so we're seeing it all over again, but now it seems, Andy, that we're in the end of a dollar life cycle because what, as you know, the real inflation is just the death of a currency, the death of a financial system, which, which maybe seems appropriate to segue to the, the next question as a follow-up, which is, now that we are seemingly at the end of the dollar's long protracted life cycle, which was, as you know, supposed to be temporary with Nixon and, and Kissinger, um, it seems that we're having a, a rare concurrence, Andy, of a yield curve inversion, which you mentioned, the Fibonacci effect once we see a dollar index drop around 70 index or 67, as well as, as you said, the Cantillon effect, all happening simultaneously. I guess my question is, has this ever happened before in our country's history? And what does it mean for the global reset transition? I, I, I couldn't tell you if it's ever happened. I can just say that you have all of these things amongst many other geopolitical and, and moral and social things happening, including the biggest election of our lives and mm -hmm. the, the BRICS meeting in October. These things are all happening at once. It's not a good sign, I think, ultimately for for the system. It's not right. a good sign for, for the West, for the dollar. I don't know that it's all happened at once, but what I do know is that it's it's not going to be smooth sailing. Um, just all of these things converging at once would tell you that, in my mind, we're heading into a period of time where the printing press meets the Great Depression. It's hyperstagflation, mm -hmm. ultimately, where you have rising costs associated with little or no economic development, rising costs being because of inflation, because who's foolish enough to buy our treasuries in a country that has chosen inflation over over austerity, a country that has weaponized the treasury market, a country that is wayward all around the block, and then is trying to go green and lose its petro status. You're talking about insanity. And yeah. even if the, the budget was balanced today, you have two hundred trillion in debt, thirty-five trillion on balance sheet, seventy-seven trillion in social security, ninety-nine trillion in Medicare Part B. 22 trillion in Medicare Part D, all the government military pensions. Who the hell is going to pay for that? Where does that money come from in an economy that has been, you know, shuttered where you we don't produce anything, we don't manufacture anything, we don't refine anything. Everything is done offshore. Mm -hmm. And and uh, you know, so in terms of in terms of financing that debt, it becomes a problem. Well, ultimately, it's the Federal Reserve who's the buyer of last resort of our treasures, which leads to massive inflation. So yeah, I, I think that this is one of these these times where if you don't think like a contrarian, you'll end up a victim, I guess is the bottom line. But yeah. while I don't I can't confirm that all these things have happened at once, I would say there are those three things happening at once, which seem quite profound intellectually or intuitively, and add a whole bunch more, like all of the things that we talk about all the time, the BRICS, all the things happening in the country, the immigration, mm -hmm. all of this stuff. Uh it, it's not a good, a good um it's a powder keg, really, with uh, you know next to a to a, a bonfire. So, right. don't know. Hopefully, it doesn't catch fire. Well, the good thing is, Andy, with friends like you arming us with this kind of knowledge, we can steer ourselves and people safe to shore. It going, as you said, contrarian to the opposite way by, in our humble opinion, powering up with precious metals, the right foreign currencies, certain bonds, cryptos, owning land, becoming your own central bank. These are proactive solutions that our audience and your audience respect, respectively can take 
to, to counteract against it. So it's not all about, oh no, the sky's falling. It's just, no, here's what the plan is. Here's how we can counteract it because there's always moves and counter moves. The enemy always makes uh, a plan for themselves as a fail way of a safe way of escape. They just never counted on us having it. And so working together, we can create a synergy of alliance for our respective audiences. Um, the last time we talked to Andy, we discussed a gold and silver company, uh, if you recall, that was offering bonds and leases for lending physical gold and silver to other industries. Even though gold's average appreciation each year is roughly, I think, around 8 to 9%, the opportunity to purchase bonds or leases in gold or silver could provide a way or methodology of earning a dividend to where investors or retirees would not have to sell all their principal metals just to earn an income. It seems to be an attractive addition. Um, were you able to research on any of this and see if it is a worthwhile? Yeah, I actually worthwhile did an interview delivery? with with Monetary Metals and Glint together. It's out there. Okay. Keith, Keith Weiner. Uh, it's an interesting product. You know, the issue is... I guess there are, the issue to me is you could end up not getting back the metal that you want, ultimately. I mean, it is a lease. You do lose the ability to get your metal back until the end of the leasing time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it seems legitimate in every way. I'll say uh, there are no warning signs to me of it being uh, illegitimate. Uh, but I think losing the control of your metal in favor of a return um, at this juncture to me makes me a little bit concerned. Um, but, you know, for those people who have an awful lot of metal and would like, one of the neat things is that they have relationships with a lot of the depositories that most of us work with. And you can do an internal transfer directly to their custody where they will then hold your metal and, and, and lease it out for you in essence. Um, paying you a, a pretty handsome return. So I guess all I would simply say is this, uh, it, it doesn't have warning signs to me, uh, it, at least none that I'm concerned about. Um, but I have always felt that return on your money is is not as important as return of it. And I think mm -hmm. that's the one risk there. There isn't anything that is riskless. Um, from where I'm at right now, I just personally, um, I don't want to allow anyone custodianship of my metal if I don't have to. I mean, in a depository, that's one thing, but then you're giving it to that custody to a third party. So um, it's legitimate as far as I can tell, but don't think it doesn't come with its own set of risks. Sure. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. Um, I'm going to just ask you a couple more questions. They'll be kind of multi multifaceted questions to, to you know save time and honor your time as well. Um, the second to last one being this one, with the crazy amount of buyers asking for delivery, legislation in Mexico with almost a certainty of banning open pit mining, China directly sourcing silver and concentrate from miners and continuing to build solar panels, electric cars, when our government has asked them to slow down, there seems to be a goal from the east to take out the stores of silver from the west. Why? And what will happen to the COMEX and LBMA if they have no more physical silver to sell? I'm just wondering what you think about that. Well, I mean, if you look at, at the end of July, uh, there was 336 billion ounces of silver in the LBMA. And now at the end of August, there's 309 billion. That's 27 million ounces or 8.1% drawdown of the total London float, the amount of silver that's available to be delivered uh, in a month. That's a huge amount. Uh, if you look at the amount of silver that we've seen delivered, um, it's huge. Um, we've seen 24,000 over almost tw tw about 24,100 metric tons delivered uh, off a of COMEX uh, of silver since 2020, since the end of 2020, November of 2020. Um, and, and that's huge. We've seen 2,140 tons of gold delivered off of COMEX. These numbers don't even include the exchange for physical, um, it's huge. And, you know, when you see things like Russia increasing their daily gold purchases by 600% or $90 million a day of uh, about 36,000 ounces a day of gold that they're buying every day, um, we're running into a period of time where physical possession will have a very, very um, profound meaning. 
the the draining of the world's exchanges has been happening by countries that are now motivated and coordinated and sophisticated and wealthy. No one ever stood for delivery. They are doing so right now. Silver is a strategic metal. It is not industrial as we led uh, we're led to believe. The plurality of its demand in things like green and and digital and electrical and electronic and also military is massive. And when you see, you know, a country like India purchased 700 million ounces over the last three years, 800 million, that's as much as on the entire LBMA. They only have 300 million that isn't owned or encumbered by the ETFs. And of that 300 million, much of it belongs to other people too. So a lot of this metal is not for sale, yet they're trading upwards ends of 3 billion ounces of silver per day on the LBMA. That's three and a half times annual global mine supply. This is a game that is going to end poorly. And these countries are using that leverage um, against us. And why are they doing it? They're trying to empty the coffers of everything that isn't nailed down. And you're right, China is going around uh, Latin America, buying up all the dore and concentrate, which which are unrefined forms of silver. The concentrate like a sludge and the dore, it's a bar that's about 60% refined. They They take it, bring it back to China and refine it completely. And, you know, when you talk about precious metals, that's only part of it. You know, China bought the London Metals Exchange. This is the exchange that has carries all of the base metals. They're building warehouses in China to stockpile the, the metal that is contracted on the London Metals Exchange. And, and, you know, they're going around the world buying up everything, not just precious metals and all of the deals they're striking in the Belt Road Initiative and in in the uh, the BRICS, it's being done so in a because these are the, this is all about he or she who has is has the um, commodities wins and and really that is what's happening and I think that you know um, they said that it's a you know one of the guys for uh, the state energy um, CEO rushes it's called Gazprom. His name is Alexei Miller. He's the head of it and. He said, um, you know, it's from now on, it's a case of our product, our rules. Uh, the game of nominal money is over as the system does not allow to control the supply of resources, our product, our, our rules. So, you know, in other words, he or she who has the commodities make the rules. And that's what you see happening. And that's why the exchanges are being bled dry. And not only that, the IMF is saying that currency, global currency reserves are are being devalued at an annual rate of at least 8%. This is coming right out of the IMF. So not only that, they can be confiscated or stolen if the United States dislikes something about the policy that those states are involved in. So in essence, the currency is becoming worth less than the commodities they're purchasing. This is a game where countries are moving to buy whatever they can. And the only reason they're not bitching about the suppression is because they're the ones buying it all. And at some point, once there's nothing left on the Western exchanges that people will sell at that nonsense price exchanges like the shanghai market will take over and over the last four months the shanghai exchange um cumulative volume is increased by 200 percent. it is now has greater volume than the comex it's the second most actively traded co uh, commodity market in the world so that they're beginning they're beginning to have legitimacy and when the comex and the lbma are exposed as um you know, Ponzi schemes, kind of like Bernie Madoff was when everyone said, give us our money. That is exactly when you'll see the COMEX and the LBMA lose credibility and and exchanges like the one in Dubai, you know, UAE just joined the BRICS or 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 Moscow or Shanghai. Uh, these these exchanges will then take over for the price setting mechanism of the world, uh, surpassing the COMEX and the LBMA. Great. Thank you for that very detailed analysis and giving us the breakdown. Always appreciated, by the way. I know you do a lot of very diligent, copious research to get that. That's not just off the top of your head. I, I know you're a research bug. Um, so this is the last question, as I promised, but bear with me, Andy, because there's a lot of parts to it. So I'm just going to try to unwind this as detailed and organizationally as possible. So we we have Japan. We know they're in a lot of trouble. They're They're dumping our treasury yield bonds, as you alluded to earlier, with a lot of countries. And back to the answer to your question, who's going to buy our, our treasury bonds? The Federal Reserve. That's it, right? It's not going to be any of these external countries we're about to talk about. But your point is still a valid one. Sequel, they've been buying a lot of gold. 
they're devaluing their currency for, I think, close to 25% now. So the first part of the question is how much longer before we see them jump ship into the BRICS as a means of survival? And speaking of BRICS, we've been talking about this a while. We're now inching closer, Andy, where uh, Moscow is uh, hosting it with Putin, President Putin on October 22nd to 24th. There's roughly 160 nations that will be represented, well over 80% of the world's population. As we see the seminal moment that they're going to give the dollar, the hegemony, world's hegemony, the middle finger, proverbially speaking, and get rid of it, they're, they're going to have to power up in something else. So the second part of the question, Andy, is wouldn't it behoove them and make sense to nationalize their countries, whether it's the unit, individually, whatever, and power up those currencies and asset-backed commodities, which clearly they have. And it isn't a coincidence that that event is happening less than two weeks before the election. What say you? Yeah, I don't know about Japan. I mean, they're, you know, Jim Willie says that they're going to, and Jim, mm -hmm. Jim often has a good take on things before the crowd. Correct. Um, you know, at some point, Japan has to every man for himself kind of deal, uh, and will have to make those decisions. It certainly would make sense, um, especially when we antagonize Japan in doing things like canceling that big uh, steel order, a company wanted to merge with U.S. Steel, I believe, and now they're talking about canceling it and and saying things about Japan, who has been our biggest ally, and which is kind of weird in and of itself since we dropped a you know two atomic bombs on them. But would it surprise me if they jumped ship and went uh, the way of BRICS? No, it wouldn't at all. I don't think it's going to happen uh, tomorrow, but it wouldn't surprise me before the dust settles. As far as, mm -hmm. as the currency is concerned, look, Delma Rousseff, the former president of Brazil, came out and said, in principle, it's been it's a done deal. They've agreed upon it with uh, meetings with Sergei Glaziev, who is the head of the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, at least he's their finance minister, and Putin, and they've agreed upon the unit a settlement token, which indeed will be 40% gold backed and, and redeemable upon demand in the form of kilo bars. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to happen. Why else would the BIS, who's actually involved in Enbridge, um, say that gold is the only other tier one asset? Why else are all the central banks buying the gold and repatriating it home? In reading the white paper on, on, on the unit, it says those gold bars that will be minted to fashion the unit token will be held in an escrow account within the borders of the countries that, that possess the gold. They don't even have to send their gold to a central location. They have it independently audited and in escrow within their own borders. And this is why you're seeing countries like India buy one and a half times the amount of gold they bought all of last year, just in the first four months of this year, and bring it all home along with the 100 metric tons they've had held at the Bank of England since 1991. These countries are now using gold uh, in many respects the same way they would have used U.S. Treasuries. It's outpaced the performance two to ones for the last 25 years and mm -hmm. has no counterparty risk. But now, as the only other tier one asset, will be a 40% backing of a new settlement token where the head of the, the, the BRICS New Development Bank, the former president of Brazil, this is no nitwit. She's a high-ranking official, says we've agreed in principle after two meetings. They are having a meeting here at the end of this month in about two weeks in China to help ratify this, to roll it out potentially in October. But it's more than that. Also, they have several things that they have announced that they are going to um, potentially run out or, or talk about. Um, and I jotted them down. Let me see if I can find them. Yeah, so they talked about five things. BRICS insurance, an insurance system. BRICS clear, which is a settlement depository. It will use blockchain to record securities and exchange them, kind of the same way you would think something like XRP would use. Exactly. Uh, a payment system called Pay, which will be B2B, business to business, and Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing. Uh, a platform for international settlements, that's Embridge, and a common unit account. That is the unit. Embridge, uh, Saudi Arabia just became a full participant in, by the way. They are now, there's the four countries that designed it, China, Hong Kong, uh, Thailand, United Arab Emirates. Now you have a fifth that is a full participant that is Saudi Arabia, about 25 or 30 observation uh, participants, uh, countries that are, are are watching closely to how it unfolds. And now the BIS is standing behind it, the same entity that reclassified gold as the world's only other tier one asset. 
So it becomes very clear to me that indeed this is happening. Whether or not it comes out in October remains to be seen. But uh, I do know as well, you mentioned all of the countries that are uh, going 59, I know, have formally applied, according to mm -hmm. Delma Rousseff. And, and, and that was the comment we received uh, a month ago when she came out of the meeting in Novograd. That coincided with the G7 meeting that the royal crown prince turned down to go to the G7 meeting and sent his delegates to the BRICS meeting. So all of these things are somewhat ominous in terms of the ultimate uh, fate for the dollar. Yeah, absolutely. And and as you know, Iraq and Vietnam are, are seminal on that list, as we've talked about with their respective currencies before you, you know, both publicly and offline are, are personal discussions. And I would also say that uh, let's not forget, uh, you mentioned gold, but they also are going to be backing Russian and Chinese bonds and some iteration of silver. So they're well diversified to be able to do, as Bill says, real time settlements, something real for something real. So, uh, yeah, whether it's this or another time, I, I, they're knocking on the door. And I think uh, just being aware of that for our audience is, is key. Well, we certainly covered a lot. Sorry, go ahead. It's huge. If you're not if you're not able to see what's coming at you, you can't get out of the way of it. Yeah, yeah, you can't stop what you don't see. Um, as always, we cover a lot here, and I'm always grateful for. It. I know our audience is yours is I'm sure as well, respectively. And uh, folks, uh, Miles Franklin is one of our our key affiliate partnerships and sponsors. We're honored to have them, and they're a company that I completely trust and put my name behind with my own personal finances, family, friends, etc. So. Um, if you are looking to get precious metals, add to the cache what you have and or look at liquidating a 401k or IRA. Um, I'm not a financial advisor, but certainly Andy and his staff are, and they're more than dedicated and willing to help you as a family run business facilitate those transactions. Um, as Andy said, over 34 years with Mary, a complaint that is hard to find these days. So if you just mention my name to Andy and his team, which he'll give you in a moment, they will certainly take care of you. So Andy, if you would do me a favor and provide that information. Any final thoughts you have, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, info at milesfranklin.com. Uh, John Dowling sent me. Um, our price list that we will send you is is far superior than what you'll see on our website, as good as or, be or better than anything you'll find online. <clears throat> um, any questions you have, uh, if you want to be contacted, put your phone number down. The questions on anything you've seen on this show or anything you've heard us talk about before or questions on precious metals, IRAs or storage or any of those things, put your phone number down. We will contact you, no obligation, or just ask for the price list info at miles, Franklin, John Dowling sent me. We'll get right back to you immediately and provide you. I promise a white glove service and as good a pricing as you'll find anywhere. And uh, we've never had a customer complaint in 34 years. We'll make sure your people are not the first. Appreciate that. And folks, also, we uh, let you know if you are looking for foreign currencies, dinar, dong, zim, Chinese bonds, and or um, uh, rupiah and boulevard, that sort of thing. We do have a link there in the description where Andy's information will be as well from Miles Franklin. Just click under more and you can investigate that as well. Andy Sheckman from Miles Franklin, CEO. Thank you, brother, for being here. Thank you for the time, the knowledge, and sharing your testimony regarding 9-11. Uh, look forward to seeing you again down the road in the not-too-distant future as we see what we believe will be the climax of a lot of this in October. Pleasure is mine, buddy, and I look forward to chatting with you again real soon. So uh, until then, you and everyone else out there, stay well. Take care, everyone, and God bless. God bless.